Did you know that you can house insurance claims, folks that have lost their properties due to a fire or flood, and you can literally make thousands of dollars by doing that? Today, we're gonna to be talking about the do's and don'ts of investing in properties, specifically for insurance relocation claims, but also about the emotional side when it comes to folks that have lost their properties due to a fire or flood. This is going to be a really good strategy for those that are looking to increase their cash flow. In fact, some of my properties, we are 5Xing the long-term rental rate. So stay tuned, hang out with us, as Serge and I are gonna talk about the insurance relocation claim in depth. Serge Cozy Car, and that's not the way to actually say his last name, but he gave me that information on how to potentially say it. I know I'm saying it wrong. Cozy, cozy Car. Is my right there? Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. And you know, I'm excited to have you on because insurance relocation claims are, you know, some of the highest paying, I believe, in the in the rental space right now. But it's also there's a lot of nuances and things that make this business very difficult. And one of the cool things that you have that I really like about you is not only are you working for a company that as a relocation specialist, but you're also a real estate investor and a real estate agent. So you kind of have that, you know, that sphere of all these different hats figured out. So Serge, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick so the audience knows who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is Serge Kozhukhar. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine. This is where my uh, parents brought me from. I'm here in, uh, in the United States. I call myself born in Ukraine, but a uh, law abiding American citizen. Uh, I am a real estate agent in uh, State of Pennsylvania, New Jersey. So I do serve um, Philadelphia metro area. And for the past eight years, I do work on insurance claims basically day to day. That's my basically bread and butter. And um, literally every single day I close those claims, work on them and have maybe a little bit inside of information that maybe I can share. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want you to share too much information because, I mean, I definitely want you to share information, but I know that this space is so, um, you know, there's so much nuances to it that are that can be difficult to understand. So let's kind of just dive into the surge. Um, where, when we talk about insurance relocation claims, like, can you explain what that actually is, what a relocation claim is? You know, do you want to kind of break that down? Sure. So basically an insurance claim, uh, every single property that, especially under the mortgage, has some kind of insurance homeowners insurance that, that, that they called, right? Um, even if you don't want to, um, I know, let's say in the state of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, mortgage company makes you to buy one. And if you don't want to, they will buy it for you. They will insure, insure the investment. So in any case, um, something happens to your primary residence or investment property, uh, such as water damage, fire damage, tornado, and such on and such on and such on. Uh, you will make an insurance claim. So while that insurance claim is happening and the insurance company are fully restoring your house or partially restoring your house, in most of the cases, you're not supposed to live in, in the house. And this is where uh, that thing comes in, insurance claim, you need to live somewhere else. For the short term, uh, the insurance company will furnish for you unless they find, let's say, mid-term or short-term rental. Got it. Yeah, so that's that's a pretty, that's a really good breakdown of, of what it actually is. And do you know the, the nuances about um, you know, what the claim is. Like, I've heard like loss of D coverage. That's every coverage is different for every person, right? Absolutely. So there's not one specific coverage for everybody. No. So basically every single person in every single state and every single city, the coverage are different for the car, for the house, for the investment, for anything that you insure. There is a bunch of things that you can, let's say, buy extra, right? So, uh, even go back to like basically your mortgage company. Mortgage company, they they have like a minimum that they want you to be for like insured. However, there is a bunch of extras that you can be insured. Uh, the higher amount, for example, um, higher ALE, additional living expense. This is what covers in in event of the insurance claim covers maybe for the longer or the higher amount. It's not limited. I believe there is like almost no exactly same policy nowhere in the United States, because every single policy that I see from inside is, is like basically totally different. So there's no one size fits all. I think a lot of times people people think that that's the case. But um, just so you know, too, most claims that you see, I'm assuming are like a flood or it could be a catastrophic event, such as like a hurricane that we just had that passed through California or, you know, some kind of um, disaster that happens either, um, you know, on accident or let's say again, like a hurricane or something. So when it comes to that, the loss of a property, and I see this all the time, like working in the space, losses can mean a lot of things. It could be an actual structure fire. It could be somebody left a faucet on upstairs. It could be a pipe that burst. Is there any particular claim that you see the most? Sure. Uh, the most, I'll say there are 
any kind of fires. Mm -hmm. Fire, smoke damage, and the water damage. Those are, I'll say, three the major ones. Obviously, I'm not talking about like California, California fires when it's like major event or uh, any kind of like tornadoes going through Oklahoma or any kind of uh, hurricanes going through Texas or Florida. That's like totally different. But uh, uh, on the daily basis, those are fires, smoke damages, and the water damages. The I'll say the top three uh, cause of damages and insurance claims. Yeah, you know, I was reading a statistic actually by the um, the it was the fire instruction. I don't remember exactly what it is. I wish I had the acronym in front of me right now. But they were saying that every 88 seconds in the United States, somebody loses their home due to a fire or some kind of flood, like literally loses their entire home or their, it's inhabitable for over 30 days at a time. So if you think about that, that's a lot of claims that people are putting to these insurance companies um, a lot of the time. So um, that's one of the things I'm going to bring up to you right now is when it comes to the insurance claim side of stuff, like, you know, is that process happen fast? Can you kind of explain like, cause what you work for Dan housing and I've actually worked with, with a couple of people over at Dan housing for, for many years now. Um, and I, I really do enjoy the company a lot. So I want you to break down, or if you can break down, if like, say I lose my home today, what happens on the back end when you guys are connected or contracted or connected? Can you kind of explain that? Sure. So number one, you got to pick up your policy and call your insurance and make a claim. Mm-hmm. So, so you're not going to lose your time. Uh, so let's say you had a fire, right? You called, make, made the claim. Uh, the first thing that you go and you go into the hotel. So uh, the housing agency assigned any kind of, there's like about 10 of them. Uh, the insurance company assigns the, some kind of housing agency. So they will cover the hotel up until your insurance adjuster approved the housing. This is where my job, job comes in. I get the claim and I start to search for a short-term rental, mid-term rental, or just uh, some kind of house, which is for rent, but I, I am negotiating the shorter term with the landlord, agent, management company, and so on. Um, usually, if I find it within a, a day, two, three, uh, if everyone is on board, if the insurance adjuster approves the price right away, and if the people dislike the hotel and they would like to move in as soon as possible to the property, uh, the process is like within a week. What? Again, just because there is a lot of people involved, sometimes it takes two, sometimes it takes three, sometimes even longer. But I'll say um, within a week or two, if everyone is, you know, is on board of the actual insurance claim filed, the family should be in the housing. So within two weeks of the actual incident. So that's, that's something good to know is that the actual, like, so say I have farmer's insurance and my property is burnt or whatever, some kind of damage that happens. Um, the the farmer's insurance will actually pay for the hotel that I'm going to go stay in with my family. So they're paying for that. But then on the back end, farmer's insurance is sending out to you guys to, to connect with the relocation specialist who's now going to go find housing. So can you kind of explain what that housing process looks like? Are you, and this is something that I've been able to build a relationship with you and, uh, you know, other people over time. Um, you know, I, I think it's so important to have these connections and, and these, these kind of reciprocal relationships where we're able to help each other out. But what do you, what's the process that you go and do when you got that claim? Are you looking on Zillow? Are you listing, are you looking on Airbnb? Are you looking on Furnish Finder? Like what's your process? Do you have a database that you guys have already? Like what does that typically look like? Yeah. So, um, I think every account manager or SR has their own kind of system, more or less a uh, bigger company. They kind of give you like Zillow.com and other websites to search. Uh, I have a, so I have basically for myself. Uh, made a certain system that I go by. So I go by, number one, uh, I'm actually building a big database and sooner or later I will have it like a, as a website too. So anyone will go in and put their property on uh, and have like a pin dot on, on the map or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two is I like compass.com. It does not cover 100% of United States, but major cities. Uh, that website basically pulls out every single listing as the on MLS for sale and for rent. So as the Compass agent, you know, I am able to get phone number and the email of the agent that represents the property right away. Gotcha. So I contact them and I like I email them. Um, then the next one will be Zillow.com, and I guess the last, which I don't use anymore i used to use airbnb a lot but you know when you book something for, 
like from Airbnb, you cannot be 100% sure that uh, your host extends when you need to. No flexibility. Yeah. So we prefer to sign the lease. When you we sign the lease, for example, for three months and then months to months, we say it's got to be in the lease that we do months to months up until we provide you like a 30 days notice to the Right. Okay. With the Airbnb, sometimes it doesn't work out and it's it's basically a pain in the butt. So you need to move them out or relocate them in the middle of their house is not fixed. Uh, it's basically a double job. And first you had like three months or six months when you move people in. At that time, you will have a month to months. And months to months, it's almost impossible. It's always possible to find something. I have a bunch of different examples, even with 25 cats. We can't find anything, but it just takes time and money. Yeah, I love that. I love the analogy of twenty-five cats because you've probably seen that before. Twenty-five cats and one possum. <laughs> I have no idea how the possum came in and like to that family, but it was twenty-five cats in the possum. It was right in Pennsylvania. I remember it was the middle of February. They had a fire. It, it, yeah, it was a pain. How can you explain to the people they have twenty-five cats? The first question is like, why would they have twenty-five cats? Yeah. Like, I don't know, but they have 25 cats. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, I mean, I have one cat and that's, that's, I mean, that's a lot. So 25 <laughs> yeah. is like, I can't, I can't imagine. And that's the thing too, that I want everybody to realize, like when somebody loses their home, that is such a crazy event that emotionally, um, you know, physically, like that's a toll on your body. And I remember, Serge, I'm going to tell you guys a story real quick. I used to be in this business. I cared about making money. Like everybody, just like everybody wants to make money. But there was one woman that I met. And I actually met her at the property and she sat me on the dinner table and she said, Jesse, I, we lost everything that we had in this fire. We're in three different hotels right now. And I just want to be able to sit with my family and have dinner every night. Like, that's the only thing that I want. We can't do that now. We've been in the hotel for three weeks. We haven't been able to find the right property. And she was like crying to me, Serge, on, on the table. And her son was there. Um, she brought her, she had a dog. She brought the dog. It was a very, very well-mannered dog. And her husband was there. And they were just like, you know, that moment right there changed my the way that I looked at this as it's I'm not about making the money anymore, which money is great again, but now I'm going to serve people like that's where my business model changed. And you know what, Serge, after I did that and I started putting those people first, my business like started to take off because it wasn't financial, um, the financial part that was driving me anymore. It was more of like the humanitarian. I want to be able to help these people. I want to be able to find a comfortable housing where they can literally just the most basic thing is having a meal at a table together which you know, a lot of us take for granted in a lot of ways. So for me, that happened and all of a sudden, 2018, my mind shifted, like, how do I serve these folks as opposed to make dollars off from? Because again, at the end of the day, these insurance companies do have money, Serge, like you, you, it, it, it is true, you know, and they're, and they're paying higher amounts of money. But also, um, again, that there's a human element to this that I think is so important. Do you see that often, Serge? Is that something that like, that you, when you connect with these families that you hear or? On literally on the daily basis, I just spoke with the family that I'm moving in on Friday in uh, Warchus, uh, in Massachusetts. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that city. Worcestershire. So, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the family, a freaking 18 wheeler, went to their house, through their house in the middle like, of the night. You know? So they basically, it wasn't the fire, but it's all like they lost everything. And as of right now, uh, usually you're not getting anything more than six months. So, any. Uh, when I get the claims, usually it's from one month to six months, you know, three months, two months in California, it's like three to two months if it's a water damage. Uh, yeah. Now I got approved nine months right away and then months to months. So how long is it going to take to restore the house? God knows, anywhere between nine months and 24 months. But the human ele element is always there. Uh, yeah. I have numerous examples when the, in the event of fire, someone died. Yeah. You know, and you gotta talk to the family in the event of fire. Or I also worked on the gas explosion in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, about like five years ago. It was a mm -hmm. big claim, and I didn't know, but someone told me that it was all over the TV. Someone also died, and while you working with the family, you know, every single time you call them, uh, you just trying to put yourself together. What you gotta say and what you kind of not. There is sometimes attorneys involved, sometimes public public adjusters involved. Um, so also majority of the families, they have pets and the pets are part of the family. You know, pet died, the dog died, it happens, it happens often. Uh, and I didn't realize how often it happens, but it does always on the daily basis. Like you said, 
uh, eight, every 88 seconds, the fire happens yeah. in the United States somewhere. So you like it if it's no one home and no one died or, you know, we going through a lot sometimes. Yeah. I think for me, like I have empathy with that on that end, because again, you're having these hard conversations with these folks. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to be mindful too, Serge, of like, you know, what these folks are going through. And not only that, but they're probably in hotels or probably waiting on adjusters. Like they just want to resume their life or, you know, it, losing somebody's hard enough already, but then to lose your property on top of that, it's just, man, it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff to to take in. And you're, you're, you know, you're, you're kind of on that end as well, like, you know, nurturing them along. Well, yeah. Uh, again, on the daily basis, you, I'm not the psychologist, but, uh, you know, you're trying to put your sentences in the right way. Uh, I usually say, I mean, at the end, it doesn't really matter what happens to your house, but at the end, you will basically have a brand new one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just keep with the flow, uh, make sure you stay on top of all of that, you know, call your adjuster and make sure that you follow up. And uh, at the end, everything will end up fine. Yeah, I know you're right. And thankfully, there are companies that are able to help on that end. So that's going to take me to this question now. Um, you know, we talked about the human element. I, I do feel that that's most important. And then the financial element is is a tricky one because there's not, and I'll just give you guys an example of like some of my properties. In fact, a property that I had with you guys, um, Serge, over at Dan's, um, I, my mortgage on my property is two grand. We got a, a, a claim from, it was a family that lost their fire uh, probably about 30 miles away from, from their home. They lived in another city and they couldn't find anything that met their needs. They had a dog. They had four adults that were living in one home. So it was like a, a husband, wife, and then grandma or their mom and their dad. So it was four adults who were living together. They couldn't find a place that would suit them all because they had their own space. Anyway, we ended up housing them and there's always a negotiation and you probably see this happen often where somebody will have, let's just, they're not gonna tell you their mortgage, but they're gonna go to you and say, hey, you reach out via Zillow, you reach out whatever and say their price is $3,000. Once they realize you're a relocation specialist, they're like, Serge, uh, it's actually $8,000. You know, they're changing the price from what it was to Zillow or on Compass to another price because now they realize like you're a relocation specialist and they're trying to adjust the price. And I think that's not a good business move first off. And I'll, and I'll explain it a little bit more and maybe you can help on that in on how the pricing goes. First off, if you're listing your property at, let's just say $3,000 and you talk to Surge and all of a sudden now it's $8,000, that's not an ethical business move. <laughs> like it's just not, you know what I mean? And plus you're probably just passing that person off. You're probably not even thinking about them anymore, right? Once that happens, do you see that happen often? Yes, correct. Uh, I see that often in the... It's not the specific area, but with like an agents or agent slash owners that already had some kind of experience with insurance claims uh, previously. And they basically trying to get as much as they can yeah. without even explaining the situation or, you know, so on. I literally, at least once a week, especially when I work with the big, in the big cities, uh, at least once a week, I come across someone like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they follow up and then then the price again dramatically changes, but into my way, you know? Yeah. Um, no one ever will pay twice of the amount if you advertise it at $3,000 based, non-furnished based on 12 months leads. Mm-hmm. Even for six months, you know, you pay double, that's 12 months lease. Even for the three months you pay double, that's, it, it just, just does, doesn't make sense. Probably the hotel bill is much cheaper. But again, location, 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 Right. It depends how much of the hotel. There is a lot of things or strings that we can pull, and they're all different. That's one of the things that I wanted to actually talk to you about because we just talked about this at the beginning of the of this conversation is that there's every every single person has a different loss of D coverage. Well, you and I are we can own the same house on the same block, and our coverage can be 100 percent different. So this is a question that I get asked all the time: Is there a, is there a way to like know what our max or what the max is per property. So say like somebody loses their home, are they paying a percentage of what the house is owned? Is the insurance company going to, I'm going to give you an example. Like if my home, my home is worth a hundred thousand or am I going to get paid based off of like how much my house is worth? And they cut that down into, you know, a certain percentage or is there, is there a way that that works Serge? Or is there, there's not like a formula for it? No, unfortunately there is not a formula. Like there is not a formula that. Like, let's say there is not a general formula that you can apply to even one state or even one city. Right. Every single policies are different. So as coverages. So every single homeowner's policy has like three different parts. 
One is there is whatever is restoring your house. Is it a 70%, 80 or 90 or even 100? Uh, the second part is the content. Content meaning own property, which is jewelry, laptops, the clothes, the uh, other things, uh, whatever you lost. So they will reimburse you mm -hmm. or partially reimburse you. And number three, this is, again, daily additional living expense. And that additional living expense can be different. It can be unlimited, but it doesn't mean that it is unlimited and they're going to pay off your mortgage. You know, mm -hmm. it can be unlimited, but it's limited by 12 months. Or it can be unlimited and uh, limited by 24 months. Mm -hmm. Or it's limited. Limited, usually it's like some kind of dollar amount. Hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. Uh, $250,000. Again, uh, if we're talking about the house somewhere in Santa Barbara, probably ALE, they're either unlimited or it's got to be in six digits. Yeah, because you have a multi-million dollar home there. Exactly. So, you know, it almost never happens. Uh, and uh, also the family who's living in five-bedroom house, they usually dislike to downgrade. They right. usually they're not going to go to the two-bedroom apartment. Yeah. The most of the cases, I think the cases that they will, but in the most of the cases, they would like to have something more or less in the same neighborhood, more or less something like that, four bedroom, five bedroom, even three bedroom. Um, it's, you know, it's again, state by state, city by city, coverage by coverage. However, sometimes people have really low ALE, we call it like $15,000 or $24,000, mm -hmm. okay, or like even $50,000. If, if we're talking about LA, for example. What are those fifty thousand dollars if the rent is ten? That's a five months without any fees. Okay. Yes, they can sign three months lease, but uh, they extend it one month, two months, and then they gotta go. Yeah, because that's the coverage they have. Unless they want to pay out of the pocket. Yeah, I've seen that before too, Serge. I was actually gonna bring that up where I've seen folks that they had to start paying out of pocket and say the rent that I had was seven K, like all inclusive covered, um, you know, and then all of a sudden that third month hits and they don't have coverage anymore. And they'll come back and say, you know, we need to pay, you know, 5,000 or 4,000 or whatever it is. Um, but it's good to have that information up front to like kind of know, like they're going to give us three months. And then if it goes month to month afterwards, you know, at least knowing that information ahead of time is going to be super helpful. You don't want to have somebody in the home and all of a sudden three months later, they're still there. They were, you know, the agency was paying seven and all of a sudden the owner's got to pay out of their pocket and they can't pay seven. Yep. Yeah. So that, that happens. So it's good to really understand and talk to the relocation specialist as yourself and really get that information down um, and know what's coming. So my other question for you, and I hear this all the time, and I haven't seen very many of these people that are getting started in the space search, they'll always say like, you know, do apartments work, do one bedrooms work. I haven't seen a lot of claims with a one bedroom or a studio. Do you see those often or no? I mean, I see those because I, I see all of the claims, but I see those, but they not uh you don't see them as many because on the average, what is the an average American family? We're talking about they live in the three slash four bedroom house. It's husband, wife, two, three kids, maybe dog and the cat. So th this is more or less the average. Uh, do I see one, one person? Yes. Do I see two? Yes. Without the pets? Yes. But there is an average and, and not. Sometimes I see eight and ten people. Yeah. In, one, in one family. And that's one family, one big family. So I, I know that I've talked to a lot of investors and they're just like, you know, I don't get a lot of claims. It's a one bedroom or I have a studio. And I'm just like, well, if you have a studio, somebody can just stay in a hotel. Like it's the same. In fact, it is probably cheaper to, to do that. But a lot of people have, like to have their own space. They don't want to be in that. So um, I'm, I'm glad you were able to answer that. Cause, so there is claims around that space, but just not as many because the average, I think the average U.S. household is like 4.3 people or some weird number like that. Yep. Um, so there's more than four people, which is typically like a three bedroom, two bath house is where everybody's able to, to, uh, you know, to be in that specific property. So, and not only that, but if you go look on real estate, you're an agent, there's not a whole lot of two bedrooms that are always for sale. There's not very many one bedrooms. They're always like three twos or above. That's the, typically what you see on a regular basis. So I guess I'm going to break down this too, uh, Serge, like what is, how would, how would a, a, an average person who's getting into this space, like, what would you suggest that they do? to be recognized or to be seen or to even, you know, connect with an agency or company? Like what would be the, some of the tips that you would give um, on this space? Cause I, I always talk about connecting with people, building relationships. I mean, obviously I have you here, um, which for me, relationships I feel are, are way more important than a dollar amount. So like, you know, you, your, your friendship to me is, is very valuable and it's worth more than money. And I think that again, these relationships are able to stretch out over time, which eventually, Serge, you and I can probably start our own company and create something if we wanted to. Like, that's what I like to think of. You know, you have this knowledge and understanding. Like, that'd be awesome to be able to do. So can you kind of give some ideas on 
how people can be seen? Is there a place they can register on Dan Housing, or what? What do you? What, do you, what would the information be that you give folks? Sure, like like uh, like I told you already. So I'm building like a database. So they, mm-hmm. that database uh, every two weeks I'm pushing to those housing agencies to so the specific people who need to see the list. That's number one. Number two, you need to post your properties like on Zillow. Yeah. Uh, if you have at least some kind of access to MLS or you have a local uh, real estate agent, maybe for a small fee, they can post it on MLS. So when you post it on MLS, it goes to Compass, Zillow, and all, all of the other websites. Obviously, you, you must mention that it's fully furnished and it's for the short term. This, this is how everybody will basically find, find you. So let's say today I was searching for the property and I actually forgot which state. I think it was Cleveland, Ohio. So the family is only two people. They okay with two or three bedroom house. So I put two, three, and I in some states it's work. In some, some states it's not. I put the short term in the search, clicked, six properties actually came up. With the three of those, I was able to negotiate three months lease and then months to months easy, right? That was in like literally 15 minutes. So this is, I, I guess, going to be like the biggest one. You can't just go and blast everyone because everyone will, you know, block you. <laughs> and I think that's where you have to be very intentional about like, it's like for me, like I'll reach out to people, but I'll go to them and say, hey, I'm just going to give you an example. Hey, Serge, I have a network of 250 homes or whatever it is. Like, I want to get connected to you. I can help you with your process. So the goal for me is to like make your job as easy as possible. So you don't have to go hunting. I'll do the hunting and then bring you the, bring you the dinner. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, because let's say I'm in this industry for eight years and I see my future to be in this industry besides being a real estate agent. Right. Right. So for me, the relationship is gold. Yeah. I will use it somehow in the future because like I get the claim in California and that specific zip code, uh, that specific city. I'm like, I'm calling you right away. Okay. You will have, or maybe one of your connect will have, or your student will have that specific property somewhere. You know, relationship is the goal. But, uh, also a lot of ASRs, uh, especially like AL solutions, the big companies, they were there for a year, maybe two. And that's it. There is not, a lot of people that are in, you know, spending like 10, 15 years in that industry. There is some, and I know them, and we work really well. The percentage of closed cases or claims, they were like phenomenal. You know, we do fast, we know what we do because we work like hundreds or even sometimes yeah. 500 or thousands claims together. Okay. But a lot of young ASRs, let's say, they, uh, they try. Uh, they see that it's hard. It's not for everyone, you know, to call like 100 properties a day or 200 properties a day and get 100 or 200 no's. I mean, when I started eight years ago, it was actually really hard, but then it's clicked. And, and as of right now, you tell me no a thousand times. I don't really care. My goal is to find the property. Yeah. What is an ASR? So is that like a bigger company, like an adjusted no, no, it, it's like a, a relocation manager, but in, oh. in, in, one, in one company, they call them ASR. And I forgot uh, exactly what does that mean? Something like account executive. Service representative. Here you go. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I got account it, Serge. I got it. Yep. And basically what those are is relocation specialists, right, Serge? Like that's yep. just a different term for them. Um, it, you know, every single company, they have their uh, like a small different uh, terminology. How they call those people, the, you know, some of the claim manager, uh, some of like general manager, they are totally different general managers that are a different company, but it's, they basically do an exactly same job. Got you. Yeah. There's always different names for different companies. It's so important to, to learn that. So what's the negotiation process look like for, for you guys? Because you're trying to, companies need to make money. So anytime there's a relocation, a company takes a percentage of that. And we're not going to have, we're not going to dive into percentages because every company does a different percentage. But what is the negotiation process? So say you reached out to me on Zillow. I have my property for 7,500. I'm specifically trying to go after these companies. And you know that the claim is like, you know, 5,500. How do those neg- negotiations normally work? Or, you know, if you, somebody's priced too high, do you automatically just cut them out? You're not even going to try to communicate with them? Or do you, do you like move along right away? Because sometimes I'll send messages to people and then I'll get ghosted. Nobody will respond back to me. And then I'm reaching out to you saying, hey, Serge, I'm here. I'm still waiting for you. And a lot of times it's you're waiting for the adjuster to get back to you. 
So sometimes those processes take a while, but the negotiation space, like, can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Like what that looks like? Um, sometimes they will be open and they will give me a specific amount. And that specific amount, let's say, ALE, additional living expense. Let's say it's $50,000. $50,000 in somewhere in Tennessee or Oklahoma, Oklahoma or Alabama can be a lot of money. Right. But again, if we're going to LA, New York as the New York City, it depends on what the house they want or they prefer. It's it can be like a one month of rent or two months or three months of rent, right. you know? So the negotiation is this. In the majority of the cases, you, me, or anyone else, I don't even know what is the amount of money. There, there was numeral amount of time that I spent and I provided. I thought the beautiful house, it, but it, it was over the budget. And then guess what? A day later, they're like, oh my God, I'm sorry. They have low ALE, $25,000 or like even $7,000 would not work. We need something under five. The negotiation is this. If I know that amount of money, obviously, if I, let's say, have a claim and it was approved for six months. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that that $50,000 needs to cover this six months and at least two months of extension. Right. I mean, the installation of their house literally can take 24 months. Literally. Right. But I need six months plus a little bit. So if I know that amount of money, obviously I'm going to go to like Zillow or Compass.com and put, you know, that I'm searching something like under five or four or three or at least some kind of thing. So I will see something cheaper. Overall, there is no um, general rule. I just go by the area so if i get if i have their uh, address so i try to relocate them as close as possible so i see what the house they they have let's say it's four bedroom and i'm trying to if they have kids and they trying to be in the same school district but again if there is nothing uh and you're not willing to stay in the hotel probably you will sacrifice and move somewhere else basically i send the general email uh, to the agent first and I'll do it let's say if one zip code let's say it's small zip code and it has like 20 properties so I send like 20 different emails or same email to everyone and then if no one calls me back while I'm doing that I start to call when I negotiate me personally I'm trying I tell them that we're willing to pay more than the asking price so we're willing to pay the premium and uh, um, I ask them to give me the amount of money because sometimes what I think is fair, but they come in even lower. So why would I pay more right. if they will agree for less? Okay. Also, there is not no general general rule of that. If there is no pets, and we're talking about six months, I'm trying to uh, offer about anywhere between fifteen and thirty five percent over the asking price. Yeah. But again, it depends how many people, where we at. There is like way too many things. And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people think that like. I'm going to buy a home. It's going to be a three bedroom, two bath What the average person wants. I'm going to go after relocation companies and expect to get their place booked. Like it doesn't work like that. It has to be, and you just said this perfectly. It has to be the right zip code. If it's available, there's kids that are involved. They got to go to the same school district. So there's so many circumstantial things that come along with this, that if you're buying an investment just to serve families that have lost their home, like you're going to put yourself in a really bad spot because it doesn't work like that. Somebody has to lose their home in that, like that vicinity. They got to like your property. They got to be able to negotiate with you. You got to find them or, you know, have somebody in the sphere. So there's so many different variables. So again, like if anybody's looking to get in this space, it's not easy. And you probably see it, Serge, like you're an investor too. Like picking the right property is sometimes difficult. But I think like for me, a lot of the claims that I get are three, four, even five bedroom homes. That's worked. I can't rely on that entire year for those to get booked by a relocation company. So it's really important that everybody understands like it's so circumstantial that the, it has to be in the right place, the right time. Family's got to walk it. They got to see it. Your place has to have availability, um, which is why I always talk about creating a network and communicating, which is, you know, how you and I got connected is being able to help you build your business or being able to help you find housing. Like you've got stuff going on. You probably working with so many claims already at the same time. So like relieve surge of some of the stuff that he's got going on. And again, these claims, they don't come just like claim after claim. It's, it's so, so circumstantial. Can you kind of add on that too, Serge? Sure. Every, every claim is different. I always tell that. Uh, I had so numerous phone calls when the people uh, still, I get the emails. I ask always, you know, if you have a property, um, 
you can always send it to me, update me every two weeks if, if it's still available or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, I ask people, please do not expect expect me to book it. Yeah. Please advertise it somewhere else also. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hate people when they think that I, 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 I am able to book their place right away. Right. You know, you, you got to find with the midterm and the short-term rentals, you got to find a lot of kind of several different like streams of income. Yeah. Is it VRBO? Is it Airbnb? Is it Zillow? Is it your mm -hmm. own website? But mm -hmm. uh, I feel like try to advertise it in the most places possible. And relationships overall is a gold. The more you have, uh, more people knowing you, uh, more people would like recommend you, right? Or if they have an ability to use your property, they will call you. And this is something that I, I, I hear all the time, and you probably get annoyed seeing this. You have people that will hear me talk about these things or hear about you know, other you know, um, people in the space talk about insurance claims. We just had a guy that got a booking in Beverly Hills surge for $34,000, like one of my students. Crazy booking, um, $34,000. But again, this is like a mansion home, huge, and that's per month. Um, and I mean, it was a massive home. But at the end of the day, I can't go to you and say, hey, uh, hey, Serge, uh, get my property booked um, and expect you to be the savior. And I think a lot of people, sometimes they think when they connect with somebody like you, they all of a sudden you're going to save them with their property. Like it's so far from the truth. In fact, I love that you said like, these are other different streams of income you need to be looking at. And that's what every smart business person is going to do. They're going to have multiple different avatars, multiple different companies. Insurance is part of that spectrum, Airbnb, VRBO, short-term rent corporate housing, you know, business communication, travel nurses, you can't just attach yourself to one industry and expect to like, you know, have surgery, surge, like save you from that. Like you can't do that. And I think that's one of the things that I always stress to people, or even you'll probably have people reach out to you say, Hey, Serge, where do I invest that? Like, you're not, I mean, you are an investor, but you're not going to go out and say, Hey, uh, I see a lot of fires in, you know, North Philly or whatever. Like, you're not going to say that. That's not your job. That's not your role. And I think a lot of times people will, <laughs> will call and, you know, you know, say those things to you. In fact, I've had a relocation specialist come to me and say, Hey, um, you know, I get people to ask me like where to invest and I'm not an investor. Like those are the worst things that you can ever ask a relocation specialist. You should be thinking like, how do I help them? How do I solve problems for them? How am I able to communicate, communicate other properties that are in my sphere so I can help them find listings that are being booked, you know, thinking outside of the money aspect and how can I serve surge or how can I serve somebody at Dan housing? That's the goal is really to do that. Once you start building those relationships, that income will come over time. And I think, again, most people, they just, they look at it in such a different lens. So I'm glad you brought that up, Serge. Well, I want to talk real quick about your, um, where you're doing real estate right now. Cause I think you, you understanding the, this business will also make you a really good representative. If somebody wants to buy property in, um, in New Jersey or in Philly or in, uh, where else, Pennsylvania, like you're the guy to go to, cause you know, like what markets are going to be best. So do you want to talk about your brokerage you're with right now, or do you want to talk about how people can connect with you? I probably wouldn't give your phone number out on here, Serge, but where folks can find you. Sure. I mean, my phone number, every of my social network, I, I put put their specifically phone number and email. You know, I'm not the, you know, I like to talk, meaning like I like to help people. Yeah. If you need to purchase, sell, rent a house, I'm the agent with Compass. Uh, Compass is the biggest brokerage in the United States, and they achieved it within only 10 years. I like the culture here. I like the brand. I love it. Uh, I like the people. I like to work. You know, we cooperate without ego. We dream big. Um, everything is great in this. Me being real, as a real estate agent with this company, I do serve uh, Philadelphia metro area, anywhere from, between King of Russia, Pennsylvania, and the Princeton, New Jersey. If you want, want to buy, sell, rent, uh, if you want to invest in this area, more than welcome to shoot me an email, call me or follow any of my social networks, LinkedIn or Instagram. First name, dot last name, search, Kozhukar. I think there is only me with that specific name and the last name <laughs> in the United States. So yeah. if you go into Google me, I don't think that you're going to miss. So there's only one search, Cozy Car, is what you're saying. Pretty much, yeah. I Googled <laughs> and I tried. Yeah, it's only me who's coming up. Yeah. And this is what, again, what I really like about you is that not only do you understand the insurance space like extremely well because you're in it but you're also an investor and you're also a realtor and i think those things alone like if i was coming if i was investing in those markets i would reach out to you and say hey serge where can i buy or you know where's the place that i could sell or you know where's the place that i could pick up where where's the place that can help me 
build this type of business as being a percentage of it. And I think you'd be the perfect person to connect with. Um, so I appreciate you so much for, first off, taking the time to talk to us um, and being able to communicate with us. So Serge, very grateful for you to spend time with us. And folks, if you want to reach out to Serge, all of his information is going to be in the show notes down below. And I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Serge. Do you have any parting words, my friend? No. Thank you for your time. I will see you soon. Uh, hopefully, we're going to do several of those and, uh, you know, keep in touch. Yeah. Has anybody ever told you you look like Tobey Maguire? One person. Tobey Maguire. This guy looks like Tobey Maguire right now. That's a Spider-Man from like the, you know who <laughs> Tobey Maguire is? Yes, I do know. So, someone told me, I'm like, no, I'm not. Why? <laughs> Dude, you look like a young Tobey Maguire. I love it. If you guys think that Serge looks like Tobey Maguire, leave a comment down below. Serge, I appreciate you, man. I look forward to the next Spider-Man movie. I mean, I next, I look forward to having you on here again and connecting with you. <laughs> Hi, talk to you.